when people ask me like what does like filming mean to me or what does a video like mean to me it's almost at this point in my life it's realistically a a, a sense to get out of bed in the morning <laughs> it's it's everything to me it's mainly the only thing I really do in skateboarding. I'm not a contest skater, and I'm not out there in all these other ways that a lot of these younger kids are nowadays. Like, the main thing I really do now is make videos, and that's why they're fucking important to me, and that's why, like, I hold them so close, and that's why I get crazy trying to film them, because, like, I love them so much. So I'm from Burbank, California. Burbank, California is mostly known for the studios, Warner Brothers and film a lot of TV shows over there. It was an amazing place to grow up, but not the best skate town. When I was growing up in Burbank, some kid had got hit by a car. He was like going down a hill, not like a skater, but just a kid on a skateboard was going down a hill on his butt and like went out into a main street and got hit by a car and killed. They kind of were really tough on skateboarding. They started giving a lot of tickets like for it, you know what I mean? And my mom was like, ended up going to court and going to court and like skateboarding became kind of a crime in Burbank. It was hard for me and my friends to actually do a lot of skateboarding there. But I mean, we did what we could. I got introduced to skating um, through just neighborhood friends and they were Junior, Mike, Brian, and Charlie King. They were probably about three to four years older, which was like a lot at that age, you know? Those were my, my influences from Burbank that really like introduced me to skating and were like, here's the music we're gonna listen to and like here's the videos, like Santa Cruz. And I seen like that not as cop as part of him like skating and doing rails and like skating curbs and just like these tricks he was doing at the beach and that's what lit my fire. That's what I realized is what I wanted to be, what type of skater I wanted to be, a street skater. And then so I have like that phase of my life and then what happens like through there is like I think I started getting a little bit more serious about skateboarding. I start doing like little contests, castle contests, NSA contests. I start getting first place in a lot of contests, just my age division, and I notice this other kid starts getting first place in every contest. Every time I'm up there, he's standing right next to me in like the next age division up, and that guy was Gabriel Rodriguez. Gabriel Rodriguez, I would have to say, would be like the first biggest break for me in skateboarding. And I remember this contest I skated with him and he did like a kickflip board slide on a rail slide bar. And this was just like way before his time. And I was like, you know what? Like I need to go up to that dude, introduce myself, get his phone number and start hanging out with him. That's a good lesson in life for anybody I think is just if you see something you like to like approach it. Breaking that little fear, that uncomfortableness for that one second mm -hmm. changed my life forever. Are you sure it's recording? Yeah. So I live in the Valley, Burbank, in Gabriel's Mid-City, Los Angeles, which is a very historical area with these beautiful houses, but which has now become the ghetto. So my mom starts dropping me off at his house every weekend, and I mean, she's pulling up with like a line of like, you know, gangsters, like pulled over helicopters, and she's just like, are you sure this is like cool? And I'm, just go, we got it. Right when I start hanging out with them, he has already like had a sponsor me tape. And this sponsor me tape is at Renee's Skate Shop. It was a record store and a skate shop in one. For some reason, Stacy Peralta, I think, is like shopping for records or even like checking out the skate shop and is given the tape. And I remember like thinking in my head, if Stacy watches this tape, he's gonna get on Powell. And if he doesn't watch the tape, he's gonna like get on Santa Cruz. It's a done deal. You know what I mean? Like no one knows how good this guy is. It was funny because I stopped caring about what all these other pros and all these other people like were actually doing and I was really just focused on him because that's how far ahead of his time he was. 
Sure enough, Stacy calls and he's going to go on like, you know, basically a trial run and Stacy's going to come check him out and like watch him skate Wilshire Boulevard and like Los Feliz School and Gabe wanted me to come with him. This is the thing, like Stacy to me was like a real like live scout. He had his ear to the street at that time. That impressed me the most. You know what I mean? I'm just like, wait, this is like Stacy Peralta, the dude that's out filming like Lance Mountain, Tony Hawk, and all these guys. Like, how did he go into Renee's shop? Why did he get that video and look at that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I couldn't believe it at the time. So Gabe dragged me in. I just remember being super nervous. Like, I think we both were like, we could barely skate, but Gabe did his thing and Stacy was super impressed. He saw something in us. And then we're like, hey, I know you like us too, but like the reason where we got all this stuff from is like Paulo Diaz, like he's the king. You gotta let him in. It was so weird because he did. And like at that point, we're like, dude, you can't just leave Rudy out. We all have to be in here. You know what I mean? I think Stacy was probably like, dude, these guys, like, you know what I mean? Like, dude. This was to us the biggest and best thing that ever happened. Like we are like, we are gonna make it. We are gonna be the next Bones Brigade. So we get to the spots and I remember like, you know, only having a couple of tries at certain things and kind of feeling like a little rush because it'd be like a half hour at the most of filming. And it's like, if someone doesn't get their trick, we're still moving on. If you didn't make it in a couple of tries, it's like, we weren't gonna sit there and wait for it all day long because like Stacy was shooting on film. The first Saturday, we do a bunch of skating shots. And so the next day, we think we're gonna do a bunch of skating shots, right? And he starts doing some pickup shots. He's doing like, you know, we're skating down like clapping, we're doing some like flat ground, we're doing some stuff. And we start realizing it's like, hey, we're not gonna like make it to the spots today, really. Like we're kind of just doing pickup shots. And I think at that time, we got a little nervous and, and Stacy reminded us, he said, hey, like, you know, we're gonna have time to film you guys again. So you gotta imagine like six to eight months go by. Stacy's like, the video's gonna be coming out and we're not gonna do pickup shots. And we're like, dude, we have to show him an edit of the stuff we're doing now. And so we get back to his office and we show him the tape and he's just like blown away. He's just like, I mean, it's unbelievable. You know, what, what you guys have like done in this small amount of time. But I'm gonna tell you like, you know, it's not your time right now, but you will have your time. And, and your time will be big, you know what I mean? And to hear him say that and like, you know, it, he was absolutely right. And it did happen like that. We loved Stacy so much and he was always super honest. And so it didn't bother us, we just accepted that. That moment of being able to hook up with Stacy, being able to film, being able to be in that video, it didn't showcase what we were capable of, but it like introduced us to the scene and left an amazing mark and like so grateful for that. And I think that that would lead me down the line to work with Spike, to work with Ty, and to work with all these other people, you know what I mean? But I think that like, that was my first extremely big break. Ban this that just came out and Stacy quit and we were bummed. You know what I mean? Like Stacy was everything. Like he was the one that like understood us, got us, whatever. It's like, you know, who was going to be the one we talked to now? And luckily at that time, it was Lance Mountain. You know, he was actually shooting photos with us and he would invite us to his mini ramp. And like, you know what I mean? He made us feel part of like the Bones Brigade. You would think that there would be some like day, like some single line that it's like you rode for Powell and now you ride for Blind, but it wasn't really like that. It's like, you know, Stacy had quit and somehow me and Rudy just started hanging out with Mark Gonzalez. And I think for the next like six months, we were actually staying in Mark Gonzalez's house in Huntington Beach. And I remember just being so blown away by the tricks and the spots that this guy was like doing. I was like, dude, I wanted to stick as close as I can with this person. It was like this Gabriel Rodriguez effect all over. And it's just such another progressive time in my life. Everything was so new that he did. Nothing he did was just normal. And I remember like sometimes like struggling with that. Like, why can't this guy just go skate normal? You know what I mean? Like it had to be a curvy rail or like some like hard bank or like some, you know, massive obstacle. 
nothing was official, you know what I mean? But we were already like wearing getaway, riding world boards, like, you know, we had like been drawn in our grip tape because like we're hanging around Mark. And at one point, like Rudy shows up and he's like, hey, I'm gonna like skate for blind. And I was just like, okay, like I am too. Like we kind of already are, like, you know what I mean? We're already like staying at this dude's house. We skate with them all the time. It's like, let's not fool ourselves. We know what we're doing here. So Mark takes us up to Tony Hawk's house and we were still on Powell at the time. So we get to Tony Hawk's ramp and he's skating and I'm like, do the nose blunt. Go. What do you want me to do, dude? Nose blunt. I'd already seen him do it on a small vert ramp and it was just, you know, way ahead of its time. And uh, I, he puts his board backwards and he's just doing no handed blunts. And I think at the time, like, he didn't really want to show Tony Hawk the nose blunt because, you know, he's probably saving it. And, like, Tony's Tony. He's probably going to, like, do a bunch of variations after it. And I remember it was funny in that session, like I try to do this frontside air and like I bail and I think I land on my elbow or something and like, I think I like fractured my rib. I just tried to skate out the day and like play it off like it didn't hurt. But so we have this like great session and uh, I remember at one point Mark and Tony are talking and I remember the demeanor of the session changed. And it was kind of like weird, we felt the vibe and I was like, all right, this is weird. You know, Tony seems like, you know, kind of bummed out or something. And when we're driving home, I remember Mark was telling us that like he told Tony that like he wanted us to ride for blind and that we were gonna ride for blind. And I think Tony was bummed, man. And like, I was like super bummed because like Tony is someone I looked up with crazy. And I didn't want to offend him in any way. And like, nor was it, about Tony or Powell, it was just about like the reality. It's like, you know, Stacy had quit and that had a big effect on us. And now Mark was our Stacy. <laughs> you know, at that time too, you have to realize like Powell was really big and Blind was small. So even like certain people in my life were like, you know, like even my mom or something would be like, you, Powell is your dream team. What are you doing? And it's just like, I, I don't know if you would understand, but I want to go over here with this guy. Like, he's the best. I want to be next to him. Now, like, it's official. We're on blind. The crew is like me, Mark, Jason, Rudy, and Spike. And so Spike Jones at this point, I have no idea who this guy is or who he is to become. But he's just as, like, young and wild as Mark and Jason. What do you think, Spike? Seriously. <laughs> you think I need to go to the hospital, Spike? I remember the first time that Spike showed up to shoot my first blind at, it was like a backside nose grind on the bench. And um, it was just such a different working environment than what I was used to with Stacy when we went to do something. It was a big production, you know what I mean? And in this way, it was like me and Spike show up to the school and like shoot this picture and we're out. And I'm just like, this is comfortable. And it felt like just friends out doing the thing. I remember just thinking it was going to be a different feeling working on this project than it would be for working on the Powell project. This was going to be something that was going to be more trick based, I would say, you know what I mean? And focused on the trick and making sure we got the right trick. One of the first like trips I took with Blind, we went up to San Francisco and it was interesting because like the first spot I think we got to was like San Luis Obispo, I think, when Mark like board slides that really long like flat bar. Mm -hmm. And so we get out of the car and like Mark tries a couple of tries and it's like all of a sudden it's like there was Jason out there like he pulls out a camera and he's going to shoot at one angle and Spike was going to do another. It was just so rad that it was like very like hands on and just us doing it. Jason and Mark were unbelievably good and around the time of the blind video there was like all these older pros which were in the same age generation as Mark and Jason. And I mean, they had to have been 21, 22 at the most at the time. And these guys were being pushed out of skateboarding. And what I found with Mark and Jason is that they were two definitely people that were doing some of the best skating of their lives. They were like in their prime.
right towards the end of the blind video, like skateboarding was about to go into a very sloppy area. You know what I mean? I think like one of my last tricks was like a late shove it big spin or something. And it's like, that was right before skateboarding probably got pretty nasty. I remember having a moment with Jason one time where, you know, Jason was good at always joking around and making, making like fun of a situation or just making light of it, you know what I mean? To get a point across. And I remember like, you know, one time I was like doing some tricks and Jason kind of mocked me skating and like making fun of like, you know, how would you like to see something like this or like this? And it was at a point where like he saw the reaction on my face, like, you know what I mean? That I was kind of hurt by like what he had done. He was like, oh man, I'm just joking. He had like very high standards of how he liked to do his stuff. And I think that that was like one of the biggest influences Jason had on me is like showing me, you know, you can do anything you want, but how do you want it to look? That was a super important lesson at a young age when like I was just thinking the only thing was important was just doing new tricks. I think too, that during that time of the blind video, everything was going really trick based and the blind video had some lines in it and the flow of the video just flowed and it just brought a refreshing view back into skate videos. You know what I mean? Which would be the path that people would take from there into like our, basically our modern day parts that you see today. The funny thing about working on that video is that that was a time in life where like you're so caught up in the experiences that you're having mm -hmm. and the fun that you're having with like Mark Gonzalez and Jason Lee and learning tricks and seeing all this wild stuff that like we weren't really focused on what the impact of that video would be. But when we seen the video, we were super stoked to say the least. For me it's like, now that's what a video part is supposed to look like. That's what a song in a part is supposed to feel like. You know what I mean? When you see that jazz with Mark Gonzalez, you're like, yes, makes sense. And really reflected who we were at the time. You know what I mean? So then like, you know, Mark's leaving blind and Jason ends up leaving. And I definitely felt in limbo, you know what I mean? Like with my skating, which way I was gonna go, like, you know, where's my influence? Like, you know, now it's all on me. And I think that that was like a transitional period in my skating. And so around that time, I meet Chico and Day One and Eric Costin and Tim Gavin and Henry Sanchez and all these people that are gonna be the next generation of skateboarding. I think the next best thing that happened to me as far as inspiration was Henry Sanchez. Henry at the time, he was like full of power. He was full of progression. He had so much fight in him. He was so hungry. And he was, you know, my new Mark Gonzalez. You know, one more try, one more try. It was funny because I look back at those times and I think that like I was skating really good. Like I was probably doing great, but the fact that I was just next to Henry all the time, it's just like, you know, you're just average, man. And I think that like everybody like really dealt with that with Henry, you know what I mean? And that was a challenging time in skateboarding for me because everyone was really good. And I was getting to an age where I couldn't be good for my age anymore. I just had to be good. You know what I mean? I was getting a little bit older. And that was around the time that the Tim and Henry video came out. Also, oh, like the main point I want to talk about right here is getting montaged in that video. Mm -hmm. And so, and what like a blow that was like to me and like who I thought I was and like, I don't know if this is like- Montage in what video? Tim and Henry. You had a part for the Tim and Henry pack of lies? Mike Ternowski had come in to help like with the blind video and he took a look at the footage and he decided to make it a Tim and Henry video. Tim and Henry get full parts. The other guys just get a couple clips and we're going to market it to sell these boards. You know, Mike Chernowski was making a lot of good videos at that time. And for him to step in and be like, this should be in the montage, like, that hurt me. Because that was a video we had filmed for, and like, I had a part for that. And I remember having a long talk with him, and he was like, it's not about that, it's just a marketing thing. I wasn't resentful, or like, you know, talk shit or anything like that, but I just remember being hurt. And I remember like, even feeling that way, like, you know, after that video had came out, that like, people viewed me different. I think that's like when I started like sitting around at spots and not skating in front of people and like questioning myself in a very like transitional period in my life. I have had these experiences in life where I've had a first part, you know what I mean? And I've had a last part and I've been in a montage. And once you get stuck in that montage world, it's hard to get out of it. I'm there for the guy that's like when he's like, dude, I'm in the montage. You know what I mean? Like you don't understand. It's like, no, I do understand. Like it hurts. You know what I mean? And not, not all the time it's your fault. 
Sometimes it is. When I think about like a very influential time in my life, it brings me back to the World Park. And I think that, you know, it was because at the time you had this like big group of guys, you know, being world, blind, plan B, and 101, all skating in this park. And when you take a large group of guys that are super influential and you put them together, it's like it just breeds progression. And the individuals that were in that park and, and what they were doing at the time, like Rudy Johnson, Backside 180, Fakie 50, Fakie Flip, Day One Song, Fakie Big Hard Flips, Hard Flip Frontside Blunt Slides, like, you know, Eric Costin with all those manuals, all that stuff was just being invented at the time at that park. In one day, like 20 tricks would be made up. It was changing skateboarding and it had a huge influence on me. It just reminds me of like something like the barracks now. It's like when I come here, I'm surrounded by these people and influences that I don't usually get every day because different teams and different people are always coming in here. And when you get them all in the same area, like, you know, mixing them up, you will see like progression just skyrocket at an all time high. So right now we're making the transition from blind to girl. And so I remember being at Robinson's in Beverly Hills, a skate spot. And I remember Rick Howard pulled up and was like, I want to start a brand. We want to start girl skateboards. I remember thinking like, like, is this guy gonna be able to pull it off? You know, I think even at that stage, I was probably thinking like, why do they want me? But I remember it was another situation where it's like, you're not leaving to go to some bigger and better thing, you're leaving for the unknown. I was questioning the move. It didn't seem like as easy as a transition from Powell to blind, you know? And it wasn't until I started just really thinking about it, it's like who these guys were and what they were capable of and Megan was gonna be involved and hearing Spike's gonna be a partner in it and like having that relationship with the blind video and the success over there, it really like sold me on the deal. I think that was probably like one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. At this point, Girls Get Started and Girls Ran Out of Extra Large. It's a clothing brand by the Beastie Boys and we have a little office space out of there, and I think they go to make goldfish. That was a point where I was skating a lot, but not filming. I was over filming, and I think every skater will probably go through this at one point in their life when they're just like, I can't film, it just doesn't work out. Skate great, but every time I pull out the camera, it just doesn't work for me, it makes me unhappy. And I think when that first girl video came out, I was bummed not to be a part of it. And at that point, I tune out. And I'm like not even hanging out with the girl dudes. I'm hanging out with the menace dudes. And I think that they were working on 20 shot, the video. And so I'm just skating with them. And um, that's who Gabriel was hanging out with. And so I started hanging out with Gabriel again. And I ended up back at like Lockwood and Los Feliz with these guys. And I think that that was like um, some weird time in my life where like I ended up right back where I started. It was just like home court and I noticed that through watching them put together their video parts, it motivated me to do my own. And I think one big thing is that Chocolate had started at that point and Gabe started filming. And so like, it just really brought back, I think some, I don't know, childhood memories about just doing it again. I think it was just like having been montaged and then missing out on this girl video and like just watching someone else close to my life get motivated about something lit some fire under me, made me want to do it, made me want to be a part of it. So the next video part to come out for me would be Mouse. And I think that um, Mouse was probably a video that was recorded closest to what should have been my prime. I think like at that time, I wasn't cocky, but I was confident. The confidence at that time helped me try things. It didn't make me land stuff, but I was like open to trying things. You know what I mean? Like, I'll try it. During that time is the time when I realized like, if you dedicate yourself, you could do whatever you want. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you're really passionate about like getting this trick, with a lot of hard work and sweat, you can, you can do it. Something that's super important like, you know, through all these like videos and stuff is like the relationship with the filmer. And I think that um, during Mouse, I had a good relationship with Tim Dowling. And Tim Dowling was a skater that was really good and a good close personal friend. When you have that combo with someone, it's just amazing. It works out so good. Nowadays, when I want to go film, you kind of book it. And you book the place, you book the location, and you book everything, the trick. And it's just like, that's how we do it now, sometimes. But with Tim Dowling, it was just, 
it was not forced. It was like, I'm going skating with my friend and we have a camera. And I think when something is not forced, it translates. You could see it when people are just having fun. And that's what it was. I think it's why people liked it the most. I think a lot of skating I had done before that came from influenced by others. And I think the mouse video part came within. If I were to watch footage from mouse and I see myself skating and I see myself with like some cut off shorts, like long hair, just skating. Like I look at that kid and I'm like, that kid looks free. Funny story about the switch shove it nose grind the, on the little rail at the end, it was in the credits. A lot of people were like, why was that trick in the credits opposed to like being like your last trick? It was all about because Tim Gavin grinded the rail first and everyone was so psyched and it kind of like motivated me to land my trick, you know what I mean? And I was like, you can't put that trick in without Tim's 50-50. Right. And I think they tried it and like they were just like, it's too long of a gap, it just doesn't really like work, you know? Right. The other thing was is that I had tried a switch shove at 50-50 on a bunch of bigger rails that I didn't get and I think it just didn't feel the same. It was just kind of didn't feel the same putting on a small rail, so it just didn't feel good to me. But I think the most important thing is like through that part, like I really did show my love for like ledges and my love for ledge skating. Yeah. And to end it on that trick really like let me know that like it's where my heart stood. At the Mouse premiere was probably like one of my greatest achievements. You know what I mean? To like sit down and watch that premiere and see myself and be like satisfied because I think it's so hard for a skateboarder to be satisfied with themselves. Mouse was one of those moments in my life where like I sat back at that premiere and I was like, good job. After finishing Mouse, I remember a part of me being like, you know, I had it all figured out. And if I had to make a video part, I could do it really quick. I know everything. I, I, it was just one of those points where it's like, you're super young, you don't know everything, and you think you know everything. You feel like you've succeeded, so you kind of just like let your guard down. That happened. And I just kind of like faded out. We go to Barcelona on a girl trip. And this is like, I've kind of been out of it for a little while. And Ty Evans comes on the trip. And now like on our girl trips, they used to just be full of party. You know what I mean? And so I noticed right in the beginning of this trip, it's like skate spot, skate spot, skate spot. And I'm just like, what the hell is going on, man? Like this guy, like he's just got everybody at skate spots nonstop. You know what I mean? And that was like my first introduction to Ty and how Ty works, you know what I mean? I wouldn't see that again until we started working on Fully Flare. When I look back at it now, and because obviously at the time like I wasn't caring, so I just wasn't, wasn't there, mm -hmm. but when I look back at it now, it's like, yeah, right, was such a great video. I think like out of all Ty's like girl films, it's like this was like the Goodfellas, and I was so bummed I missed out on it. It hurt me because I think that like that could have been some of my best years and they were missed out, you know what I mean? And I wish I could have been in there with those guys. When I came back, Rick and Mike were like, you know, we want to give you an opportunity to skate and, you know, film a video part and do whatever you want. I had just got through a time in my life where it was like all about me showing up and just being willing. And that was like the motto I was going to live by, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then right away, I'm faced with someone giving me this huge opportunity that I'm super fearful of. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, fuck it, this is it, man. You gotta go for it, man. It's everything that like, you know, people are suggesting you do, so why don't you just like take a chance and go with it. Being hooked up with Ty Evans changed the game for me. You know what I mean? Because Ty was someone that did not let me settle for less. I remember the first day we got in the van, I'm like, dude, I'll do a couple tricks for this video. And he's like, I'm not putting this video out until you have a full part. And I remember being so upset by just the stubbornness of him, you know what I mean? Like, why won't he just let me do what I want to do? I just barely want to be in this thing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he never backed down. It was his drive and passion that carried me through that video. I had like my little dark period, and then I get back into skateboarding, and the only place that I'm skating is uh, Jason Hernandez Ledges with Gino Iannucci. And then like, you know, I find out about the barracks. This is before the barracks is even around, but it's Eric and Steve skate park. And so the barracks was the first time where I had a place where like I can learn how to skate again. When I have that like opening intro shot and fully flared with like the gates like open up and it's like me standing there, like that meant a little bit more to me because of that situation. 
Once I finally got that dedication to like set in that I was gonna do this video part, it was on. And I think that I definitely transferred my addiction of drugs and alcohol into skateboarding. And it's a very scary thing because I sometimes will base the quality of my life based around how I'm skating. If I'm skating good, life's great, my relationship's great, and everything else around me is great. But when the skating's not going good, it could get pretty dark. And it could be an extremely dangerous thing because skateboarding comes in waves, man. And you have to realize that, man, there's gonna be ups and there's gonna be downs. You know, the interesting thing about Fully Flared is like, I think by the time I had got on, like some of the people had full parts already. Like I think Brandon Beeble was pretty much done. Like Mark Johnson already had like 10 minutes worth of footage. So I was coming in really late. One of the greatest things that happened during the filming of Fully Flared is I met Brandon Beeble. I was always cool with like the older dudes, you know what I mean? Because I grew up with them. But like Brandon Beeble was one of the younger guys on the team and I just remember Beeble being like super open and cool about everything, man. Like taking me in, letting me into his house. And I know we traveled a lot during that video, but the big chunk of that video was filmed in Sacramento. Me and Mike Mo would like fly up there for the weekend and like try to get clips. Mike Mo must have been 15 at the time. I was probably like 30, so he was probably like half my age. And uh, this is his first video part, you know what I mean? And it was strange at the time because when I got on, I was like already old in my career, you know what I mean? Like trying to make this like kind of comeback. And where these guys were at, like they were at the top of their game. You know, those younger guys accepting me and really taking me in like that, it like really changed things for me and it made me feel part of the team, you know? My last trick in Fully Flared, like you see I do that 270 tail slide and it's like that handshake with Brandon Beeble. I think Ty edited that because he knew that bond that was created with all of us. When it comes to like picking like, you know, clips and music for like video parts, sometimes like I try to give a little bit of input, but I try to stay out of it because like I play my position, man. I'm a skater. These guys have been making videos and putting songs to edits for like a while. That's like their strong point. Just because a trick took me seven days to do and four hours apiece, I'm gonna want that in there, whether it's sketchy or not. And sometimes you gotta let the authority like pull that out. You got too much emotional stuff wrapped up in these tricks to be like judging what goes in and out. So I like to give them as much creative like play as possible. I remember being at the premiere because you don't get to see the whole video before it comes out. You know, you're watching it at the premiere just like everybody else. And I remember watching this video and all of our hard work on the screen. I mean, there's nothing like it. Like, I definitely like was like, man, I hope I don't choke up inside this theater. Because it meant a lot to me. Our first pretty sweet trip, we went to China. You get to China and everything's open. Marble Edge is going up and down and all this stuff. It's like a playground, man. And it really brings you back to a kid again. One thing you do have to watch out for in China is weather. Because it's either extremely hot or it's raining. And we were out there for two, almost three weeks. It rained every single day. And that was our first trip. I got one clip, I think it was a lip slide on that whoop dee ledge, lip slide kick flip. Another trip that really like had a big effect on me was going to Spain. I went out there with uh, Justin, Chris Roberts, and Enrique Lorenzo was our tour guide and our friend and our companion. And he just showed us every amazing spot out there. A lot of that footage in Pretty Sweet like came from that Barcelona trip. And it was definitely like one of my best trips. You might look at girl skateboards sometimes and think, okay, girl skateboards, Spike Jones, they got big bucks, millions of dollars, and they just like, you know, it's gonna be very easy. But no, it's not, man. Everything's very guerrilla style. Even when you do a big shoot like the intro shot and pretty sweet, like you'll see people from the warehouse there that are helping out. You know what I mean? It's still very hands on. You know, you see these big videos and you're like, oh, like someone's like, that's Ty and Spike, you know what I mean? And it's just like, no, there's a lot of unseen heroes. Meza, Johannes, people doing graphics, Roger Bagley. He spent a lot of times in like the trenches with me. It's rad when you share that experience with the filmer and you finally land that trick and like you could see the happiness in the filmer's face. You guys both did it. Like, you know, like you gave birth to this like clip, you know what I mean? And that's awesome. Sometimes you see these video parts and you think that it's everything that this guy has. And a lot of times I like to like tell people, it's like these video parts, they're just unfinished products of like what had came before, you know what I mean? It's like, I've seen guys work on tricks for like three or four videos. The switch tray nose grind, I mean, that was a switch tray nose blunt that I was trying to end my battle commander with. And it wasn't until pretty sweet, like we would actually document this trick. That was a lot of years in between there, like four or five years. 
I had the back so many nose grind switch laser for the Ender, and uh, everybody knew I wanted the switch tray nose grind. It was the last day to try it. I had some crazy idea because like Eric had did his tray flip nose blunt for yeah right. It was like the last day, like he was up in Santa Barbara and they drove the tape back to Ty and handed it off and it was like in the premiere the next day. I just remember hearing that story and always loving it. And it's like, and I remember calling Eric, I'm like, come down to this rail, man, I want you to be here. To have that like similar experience that Eric had with yeah right that I felt that I missed out on, but to do it in my own way and have Eric there and be a part of it, it was just, the best feeling ever. I think after Pretty Sweet, everyone was kind of like a little burnt out, a little fried, but it's like me, I still just wanted to film and do stuff. I remember thinking about like Eric Costin and like some classic images that Atiba had shot and I wanted to like support that and work with someone like that and have some images of myself like that. And I think that that's when I went out for this part, I was like choosing some more like special locations and photos that would look good. Not such a technical side of my skating, but more just a simplicity of it. Videos to me, they're super special. They hold like a crazy place in my heart. When you can like have an idea in your head that doesn't exist and you go out there and you learn it and film it and bring it into like somebody else's life, it's a very special thing. It's very magical to me. And that sounds cheesy, but it's one of the main reasons that pushes me. Like I like to do that. I like that, I like that feeling when I was on the other side of it. And I like to give it back to, you know, nowadays like that. I look at people like Lance Mountain that's still making video parts, and I look at like people like Tony Hawk. I wonder what that drive is, you know what I mean? Because it's not about getting more famous. He's not gonna do that. He's probably not gonna make more money. It's a personal thing that burns inside of him that he has something to offer still. That lets me know that I wanna do that for as long as I can too. It's like, I wanna put a part out when I'm 45, why not? Just because I'm not the newest, youngest kid that like I have to stop doing what I love? No way. I have to let these kids know that are, you know, behind me, how far they could go with their career. I think it's an obligation of mine. They have to have some sort of peer that they look up to, like, you know, well, he's still doing it.